Good morning, special guests, staff, and students. Welcome to the 2017 Honor Day Assembly. My name is Emma Cross, and this is Alex Chase, and we have the privilege of being your Masters of Ceremony for today's assembly. To begin, can you please rise for the singing of O Canada, accompanied by Kevin Tucker. Thank you, Kevin. Today we gather to recognize the anniversary of the avalanche which claimed the lives of seven of our students. We also celebrate the lasting legacy these students have left with us here at STS. The tragic event of February 1st, 2003 is forever woven into the fabric of our school history. But from this great tragedy, we have seen kindness and generosity take hold of our hearts. So many people walk around with a meaningless life. They seem half asleep, even when they're busy doing things they think are important. This is because they're chasing the wrong things. The way you get meaning into your life is to devote yourself to loving others, devote yourself to your community around you, and devote yourself to creating something that gives you purpose and meaning. I would like to introduce Dr. Jones, our head of school, to share his opening remarks with us. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our annual Honor Day Assembly. I'd like to extend a special welcome to our distinguished guests this morning, including parents, friends, classmates of those whom we are gathered here to honor, as well as members of the STS Board of Governors, former faculty and staff, and our guest speaker, Mr. Simon Jackson. We are very appreciative of your presence here this morning on this important day. This morning, as you know, marks the 14th anniversary of what was certainly the saddest and most tragic day in the history of our school. As most of you know, we lost seven students to an avalanche on that fateful day. Ben Albert, Dan Arado, Scott Broshko, Alex Patillo, Michael Shaw, Marissa Stadden, and Jeff Trickett were grade 10 students at the time, and they were backcountry skiing in the Rogers Pass with a group of friends and several teachers on an outdoor education excursion. Their loss left an indelible impact on their families and loved ones. And this morning we pause to acknowledge the deep sense of sorrow that still lingers today. We also acknowledge the courage and resilience that it has taken to move forward in the face of such a profound loss. And we admire the strength that we have witnessed in those most bereaved family members and friends. Every significant event in our lives, whether good or bad, brings about learning. If there's one thing that we've learned from this terrible loss, it is the paramount importance of creating a strong culture of safety in our school, including rigorous standards that can be measured, tested, and continuously improved over time. In the years since the avalanche, we have made a determined effort to do just that through extensive research, training, changes in risk assessment, and enhanced safety practices in every area of our operations, administration, and governance. In short, we have strived to achieve an exemplary level of safety and risk management, and we have shared what we have learned with many other schools and organizations around the world. With that being said, maintaining these high standards and expectations can only be accomplished through vigilance, commitment, and intolerance of any slippage, and we owe it to those we have lost to avoid complacency 
and noncompliance. We all share in that responsibility each and every day, and I urge each of you to take that duty seriously to ensure the safety and wellness of everyone. As we have moved forward in evolving this special assembly over time, we have tried to make sure it is a meaningful and special day that both honors these seven students, who most of you are too young to have known, but is also relevant to our present day student body. To this end, our recent observances of this anniversary have presented inspiring speakers and role models who can deliver a forward-looking message and one that helps us to think about how we can best live our lives. Today, we're very pleased to bring you Simon Jackson as our guest speaker, and you will learn more about Mr. Jackson when our MCs introduce him in just a few minutes. Simon is living proof that anyone who is really determined can make a significant difference in the world, no matter how young or old they are. As you will learn, Simon became an agent of change when he was just 13 and led a movement that has had a very significant impact on the environment and on endangered species. I think Simon's a great fit for our assembly today because he demonstrates many of the values that STS strives to develop in its students. A commitment to service and the idea of taking personal initiative have, long, have been longstanding values at STS and its founding schools. For more than 100 years, we have worked to instill the importance of service to the community as a central element in the character and leadership attributes of our students. Through experiences such as HOP, social agencies, local and international service projects, and for example, the work that the grade six, HOPs, uh, grade six PYP students are doing in their exhibitions, we hope that you've learned the importance of service to others and to the environment. In fact, we believe it's a defining factor in living a purposeful and worthwhile life. And I'm confident that Simon's message today will reinforce that notion. In closing, I remind you that we have come together today to honor and to remember Ben, Dan, Scott, Alex, Mikey, Marissa, and Jeff. Their lives made a lasting impression on friends and loved ones, and their loss left a terrible scar. As you listen to Mr. Jackson speak this morning, I encourage you to think about how you will live your lives and what kind of impression you will make on others and on the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. I'm sure that we have all had the opportunity at one time or another to spend time in the forever woods. I've, I have observed students studying and drawing there. Playing a musical instrument, or just quietly sitting and chatting. It has become a place for us to reflect and share time with friends. In addition to this beautiful outdoor reminder, scholarships were also established in the names of the lost students. The Forever Woods Scholarships were first awarded in 2009, and since then, over $400,000 has been awarded to students. There are currently 27 Forever Woods Scholars attending STS, of which Emma and I are two, and I can honestly say that I am honored to be amongst them. In addition to these scholarships, funds were allocated for all students to enjoy Dan Arado Day each year, and to sustain development in the fine arts by improving the theater space, bringing in guest artists, and providing scholarships for students to attend drama educational programming outside of the school through the Patillo Benzler Family Theater Fund. These contributions are examples of how the loss of these students has grown to positively affect future generations of STS students now and for many years to come. We are very honored to have here today Simon Jackson as our guest speaker. Simon Jackson, who shot to fame as the founder of the Spirit Bear Youth Coalition when he was just 13 years old, is a storyteller, connector, and movement builder committing to improving uh, our, our public discourse and shaping a better balance between the needs of people and nature. Simon led the campaign to save the spirit bear for two decades, helping create the largest land protection measure in North American history. For his efforts, he was named a hero for the planet by Time Magazine and was the inspiration for the movie Spirit Bear, the Simon Jackson story. Today, Simon leverages his skills and experiences as a strategist to help diverse clients secure a social license to advance good ideas that will benefit all of society. Additionally, Simon is a widely published author, as well as the lead storyteller for ghostbearphotography.com, a photo and essay-driven nature-focused education platform Simon co-founded in 2013. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Simon Jackson.
Good morning and thank you. And thank you for including me in this incredibly important day. My name is Simon Jackson and for 20 years I worked to give a voice to a creature that did not have one. Not because I was some wonder kid or a hardcore activist, but because I'm a passionate Canadian and I saw a wrong that I wanted to right. For me, I'm not here to tell you something that you don't already know, but to reaffirm that in every single one of us, we have the chance to shape a better world. And when we do that, we have the opportunity to, to live a life of meaning, one that can honor those ourselves, the ones who love us, and of course, those that we've lost. To share my story, I'll take you back to when it began. And really, the two most important ingredients in my story were the best gifts my parents ever gave me. That was the gift of news and the gift of travel. In my family, we couldn't afford to go on exotic vacations, but what we could do was go on camping trips to the environment around us where I grew up in Vancouver. And on one of those camping trips, I saw a bear, a grizzly bear, and I, my imagination was absolutely captivated. When I returned home from this trip, I, every night over dinner, we had to watch the evening news. And one evening, while watching the news, I saw a story on Alaska's Kodiak bears and the plans being drawn up to develop their home. In my seven-year-old mind, it was an assault on that same bear I'd seen on my camping trip, and it didn't seem right. I wanted to help. I thought, how as a seven-year-old could I help this bear? And the answer was obvious have a lemonade stand. So over the course of the summer, I drew pictures of bears and put them on telephone poles around my neighborhood, and I started selling lemonade. I shudder a little bit now to think how much money my mother spent on buying that lemonade, but nonetheless, by the end of the summer, I collected $60 to mail to the World Wildlife Fund, along with letters to Prime Minister Mulroney and President Bush Sr. A few months later, I received a note back in the mail telling me the Kodiak bear was going to be saved. And in my mind, I thought, yes, I saved the Kodiak bear. Obviously, I didn't. But it planted that seed for me. It made me realize that no matter what your age, no matter where you live, you can make a difference for all life. It was an idea I took with me through a couple of other issues while growing up. And each issue I got involved with was coincidentally successful, and reinforce that idea that my voice matters. So when I turned 13, having this passion for bears and a belief that my voice mattered, I discovered another bear, the white Kermode or spirit bear. Now, for those of you that don't know what this bear is, a brief bit of background. It may look like a misplaced polar bear or even an albino, but it's neither. It's a genetically unique subspecies of the black bear that unlike black bears you'd find here in Alberta, in one small corner of the world, one small corner of Canada's west coast, one out of every 10 black bears are born with the unique gene that makes their fur white. And they're not just pretty creatures, they play a critical role within their ecosystem. You see, the color of this bear allows them to be more camouflaged in the rapids of streams where the salmon spawn. The more salmon these bears can catch, the more rotting salmon carcasses left on the forest floors. These rotting salmon carcasses are the nutrients that go into the soil and allow the trees to grow to the size that they are. And these trees are massive. It would take 10 or 12 of you to wrap around a single trunk. And they not only provide shade for the streams for the salmon to spawn in the fall months or act as bear dens in the winter months, but of course, they're lungs for our planet. And this one bear in this one small corner of our world helped sustain the world's last large area of intact temperate rainforest. Meaning this bear matters no matter whether you live in BC, in Alberta, or anywhere around our globe. And when I found out there were fewer than 400 of these bears remaining, I wanted to give them a voice. I wanted to help save their home. So again, I thought, this time as a 13-year-old, how could I help? And again, the answer was somewhat obvious. Talk to my friends, my peers I went to school with. So I took the issue to my school and asked my teachers if I could speak to all of the students and challenge them to make their voice heard by writing a letter to the premier of BC 
giving their perspective on this issue. At the time, I hated public speaking. I was nervous, I was shy, I had a stutter, but I knew I needed to overcome my fear if I was to get the message out. And by the end of the day, I did. I helped collect 700 letters from students at my school to mail to the Premier of BC. A few months later, a letter came back in the mail, but this time it was a form letter from the Premier's office saying, thanks for your interest, but what you're asking for to save the spirit bear, not going to happen. And I was shocked. Here I was thinking that at seven, a couple of letters and 60 bucks saved the Kodiak bear. How could 700 letters not save the spirit bear? And of course, it was my first wake-up call to how difficult and complex these issues can be. But I didn't give up, not because I was particularly stubborn, but because I had seen that you could be successful on behalf of something you believed in. I realized that I just needed to work a lot harder. And most importantly, I needed to learn a lot more. I wanted to understand why someone wouldn't want to save this bear. So I started picking up with, of course, the internet didn't exist at that time. So I picked up the next best thing, and that was a copy of the telephone book, and went through to find every name of every individual, every business, every group who I thought would have some view on this issue, one side or another. Many people didn't call me back, probably because I was a kid, but many people did. And from those conversations, I gathered 300 pages of notes, which spoke to me about how important this bear was, how threatened it was, how desperately it needed its home to be saved. But equally, the trees that these bears relied on for survival, they were also important to the forest industry, the logging companies in BC, and that meant jobs for families like mine. But I also saw, looking through all this information, that there was a balance to be struck. We could save this bear without taking away people's jobs. I just had to get the message out. And slowly, people started listening to me, but it wasn't enough. As I was writing letters to the editor of papers in Vancouver and challenging other schools to get involved. But I couldn't get a, a meeting with the premier or the CEO of the forest company or the attention of the media. I needed someone else's voice to help magnify mine. So every morning before I'd go to school, I'd wake up at 6 a.m. and I'd read the papers and listen to the radio to see if there was anything happening that day in Vancouver that could possibly help this bear. One morning, I heard that Prince William and Prince Harry were coming to town. I thought, here's two young people, they're famous, they supposedly like the environment, they're going to be in Vancouver, I have to reach them. So I went down to one of their public appearances and to try to picture this, there was a pathway and on one side, you had the paparazzi, all the flashing cameras of Hollywood. And on the other side, there was about 300 screaming girls waving roses saying, Prince William, Prince Harry, will you marry me? And amongst those 300 screaming girls was me, waving a book on the spirit bear saying, Prince William, will you help me save the spirit bear? And this sort of stunned silence went across the crowd like, what was that? And that gave me the one and probably only opportunity of my life to outshout 300 screaming girls, and I grabbed the prince's attention. And they came over and started speaking to me about the bear, and of course, the best part for me at that moment was the premier pacing a few meters away, wondering how in the world I was spoiling his perfect photo op. But I realized two much more valuable lessons that day. Here was a bear that lived only in British Columbia. And while I'd hoped the princes from England would care, I wondered if they would. But as I saw their interest, I realized something. The panda bear lives only in China, but we all care what happens to it. The spirit bear may live only in BC and be part of BC's natural inheritance, but in many ways, it is Canada's panda bear. It is a global treasure that everyone, everywhere, deserves to have a say in its future. The second thing I realized was here I was now 16 years old. I had no power, I had no connections, I had no influence. And I thought that if I could reach the princes, I realized I could reach anybody. And that was the most, second most important lesson that I ever learned, that if you don't ask, you don't get. So I started asking everyone to get involved, 
to get the celebrity coming to town or the person sitting next to me on the bus ride home from school. Because if I had a captive audience, they were going to learn about the spirit book. And slowly people were taking an interest, but they wanted to do more than just write a letter. They wanted to belong to something. At that time in BC, a lot of the big environmental groups you've probably all heard of were starting to get involved. But there was a couple important aspects that weren't being addressed in this issue, but I thought needed to be. I wanted to show people who normally would never think to support an environmental issue about why they could support this one. I wanted to use science, of course, to understand what we needed to do to save this fair, but equally use economics as a tool to help solve the problem. And most importantly, I wanted to make sure that young people had a seat at, that, at this decision-making table. Because after all, we're the ones who will inherit this land in a few short years, and the decisions being made today directly affect our future more than anybody else's. So with these ideas in mind, one afternoon over hamburgers and chocolate cake in my parents' basement, I gathered a few friends together, and we created the Spirit Fair Youth Coalition. The idea was to unite the voices of a few hundred students in Vancouver. Never did I think it would grow to the size that it became, a global network of more than 6 million people in 87 countries around the world. But every campaign, like life, is 99% hard work and about 1% good luck. And the hard work was difficult. Not only were we trying to show the world that this fair existed, but we were also trying to say we can do environmentalism differently. It doesn't have to be us versus them or trees versus jobs. We can work together. But coming from a teenager, it wasn't always that well received. And of course, there was a personal side to this, as you can all relate, being in school, that when you do something different, it doesn't always make you the coolest kid in class. And I promise you, I wasn't the coolest kid in my school. When I first got involved, my friends thought it was kind of neat. But as the weeks and months dragged on, and I was still trying to save that bear, they didn't know how to accept me. And of course, acceptance is so important in high school. And I started to lose most of my friends. I'd be bullied from the moment I'd get on the school bus in the morning, the moment I'd get off. I'd have to eat my lunch in a washroom stall some days just to get a few minutes apiece. And then I'd come home and deal with the politics of this issue. And honestly, some mornings when that alarm would go off at 6 a.m., I'd want to quit on this fair on life. But I didn't. Because ultimately, every time I had that moment of despair, I looked in the mirror and thought, I don't want to go to live in a world where perhaps this bear wouldn't exist. And it wasn't that I was the best equipped to lead this campaign, but I was one of the most passionate. And I learned early on that passion is the fuel that drives change. I needed to keep giving my part. So I did and finally had that 1% good luck. It was in the form of Time Magazine. They had selected me as one of their 60 heroes for the planet, one of only six young people selected from around the world. Now, don't get me wrong, I know I'm not a hero. What this honor did was more than just recognize me as an individual, but it recognized this entire youth movement that was building behind the bear. Overnight, this went from a middle school letter writing campaign to a global issue. People started paying attention, the media, other high profile figures. And with that, people from all walks of life were taking the time to write that one letter, and letters by the thousands were pouring in to the premier's office in Victoria, and finally, the premier picked up just one of those letters, opened it, read it, and decided it was time to do something about the spirit book. We sat down for three months in a hotel room in downtown Vancouver with the forest companies, the indigenous communities, and other environmental groups. And together with the BC government, we worked out a plan of how we could possibly save this bear. And when it was announced on April 4th, 2001, it was historic. It was the first consensus land use agreement of its kind in the world. But it was only a plan, and it was only a first step. Over the next 15 years, the campaign became quite turbulent. It was a hard issue to, to campaign for. We tried to show the world the bear was still was not saved and still needed a voice. Of course, we were doing this in a more complex time. And we had to show people that it wasn't that spirit bear was more important than war or poverty or famine but that for every issue out there, there is one of us who's passionate about it. And when we do our part, we can affect change. The Spirit Fair was that one issue I felt I could make a difference for. We worked hard, and sometimes we had great successes, like making the Spirit Fair the mascot for the 2010 Winter Olympic Games, 
with the successful hope that it would encourage people to visit this area and help communities create jobs. And we had spectacular failures, like trying to make a major Hollywood animated movie with the same team that made Lion King and donate the profits back towards helping protect this bear. It was a great idea that unfortunately died in the pol political arena of British Columbia. But no matter the successes or failures, each idea encouraged a conversation. And with every conversation, individuals started feeling ownership of this issue, and quickly this became bigger than one individual or one organization. It became a movement owned by the people, and finally, just last year, a year ago tomorrow in fact, the BC government decided, finally, to save the spirit bear forever. Today, in reflecting on the bear being protected and knowing that it will always be a wild bear in a wild place is incredibly heartening. Everything I dedicated my entire life to has come true. But when I reflect, I realize that our most important success wasn't just saving the spirit bear, but it was realizing that we were, had the opportunity to show the entire world that one young person with no remarkable skills or intellect, but armed simply with a passion, can take hold of a cause and unite the world. And we need that message to get through to all of us. Because at the end of the day, people would always come to me and say, Simon, I'm one person. I can't make a difference. But as I've tried to remind them, I'd say every single day we all make an impact in the words we speak, in the choices we make. When we choose to do nothing, nothing ever changes. But when we elect to make our voices heard, anything is possible. In the months leading up to that first agreement in 2001, we sent 25,000 letters from young people alone to the Premier of BC. The Premier only ever opened and read one of those letters. But the only reason he read that one letter was because of the other 24,999 letters that made that one letter so powerful. And that's the power of one, united as one voice, the chance that each of us have to affect change. And it doesn't matter whether you're trying to protect a peregrine's falcon's nest here in Calgary or whether you're trying to rid the world of cancer. There are no insignificant endeavors. And every time we stand up to act to improve the lot of others, we open doors, we broaden horizons, and indirectly and sometimes even directly, we can change lives. For me, moving forward, I still struggle often with how can I keep having an impact? How can I keep moving forward? And I go to my forever work. I have the chance to go into the wilderness and document nature and wildlife. And to me, like your forever woods, it humbles me. It brings me back to a place where I understand my role in life. And through my new venture that I've helped start up, ghostbearphotography.com, I hope to not only provide inspiration to love nature, but most importantly to remember how valuable life is and how valuable each day is. And to remember that each of us have an opportunity to make a difference. And yes, there might be seven billion problems in our world, but the good news is, there are seven billion of us. Each with a passion, each with a skill set. And when we each work to do our part, we start slowly chipping away at these seemingly overwhelming problems, and we start to find hope. Yes, sometimes it seems impossible to understand the difference that one person can make. But we have to remember, change is never assessed at that individual level but always when we take a step back and remember, it's the sum total of all our acts that'll be written the history of our generation. And I do believe that it'll be our generation that can create a better world and can demonstrate that the greatest sin is not trying, but that by trying, anything we dream is possible and our missions are most certainly winnable. Because we are the voices for the poor, the sick, the children, the dreamers, the bears, and most certainly, the indomitable spirit of those seven students lost in 2003. Each of us have an obligation to them, to ourselves, and to our world to demand better every single day. And when we do, I truly believe we will create a better world for all life, for generation after generation after generation. Thank you so much for including me today.
appreciate you speaking to us and sharing your reflections and inspirations here today. The IB Music class, under the direction of Mr. Music, would like to present a mu musical performance, Under One Sky. students for that performance. We would like to thank you for being a part of our Honor Day Assembly and thank all of the people who have contributed to this day. There will be a luncheon held for our honored guests in the drama room immediately following the assembly. And if you would like to take a stroll through the forever woods, the pathway has been cleared. At this time, we ask you to respectfully exit from the top of the theater. Thank you.